So hello and welcome to Trinity Grace Podcast, a podcast for the edification of believers through the recovery of confessional Christianity. Today I'm joined by Pastor Oliver Ullman smith How are you? I'm very well, thanks John Mark. Good to be back on the show again. And I'm joined by Pastor Brett Shaw. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you John Mark. Today we're discussing what it means to be confessional. And we uh, must confess here that we've... Good use of confess there, John Mark, (laughs) get it straight in, yes. Uh, That we have been inspired by Dr. James Renahan's inaugural speech in 2018 for ILBS Theological Seminary. He came up with five C's that really represent the seminary. And we're going to use some of them. We're particularly taking the use of C's. So in the next few podcasts, we'll see us referring to what we believe being confessional is by using words that begin with C, maybe so that it can stay in the mind and can be helpful uh, for people. The first of these is being canonical. Being confessional is being canonical. And I think what we want to reflect here is the fact that you open the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith and it opens straight into of the Holy Scriptures. Yeah, to, to generally embrace a confession of faith, as you see, as you said, John Mark, from our opening lines of the confession, it's not at odds with the Scriptures. That's what our confession says. The Holy Scriptures, the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. There it is from the, the get-go. That is our final authority. We believe in sola scriptura, and that's what these Reformed confessions do. And the Second London Confession, it starts off with that, does it not? The, the final authority is the scriptures, or the scriptures. Yeah, amen, Brett, yeah. Perhaps just backing up a little to your reference to the doc there, John Mark. Um, yeah, so we're indebted to the doc for the idea of the seas, and uh, we're going to run with a lot of seas, uh, <laughs> but, but we are accountable for each of our own seas. So uh, don't go calling up the doc if you're not happy with anything we say. Um, don't call me. Don't call John Mark. Call Brett. It's all his fault. So <laughs> just clearing up there, uh, saving the doc a load of calls. Um, but yeah, this this point is so important. And it's something we come across again and again and again and again. When we go around uh, the country and we talk to people and, and we share these ideas as we're doing through website and so on and so on. So often the feedback comes, but don't we just want to be biblical? Isn't it biblical Christianity? What is this confessional stuff? Surely this is is a, a substitute for being biblical or a distraction from being biblical, or a second best from being biblical, or or even worse, superseding being biblical. But as we come to our confession of faith, None of those things are permissible as arguments, because if we are confessional, the first thing we are is canonical. That is to say, the whole counsel of God, as revealed in the whole scripture, is our whole and sole authority. If being confessional means anything other than being thoroughly, energetically, um, strictly biblical, then then we are not being confessional. So mm-hmm. and we we got to keep hammering that one, guys. We've just got to keep on it and on it and on it and on it. No, no, no. Being confessional is being biblical. If you want to be biblical, and this is our point, and perhaps something Brett could pick up on here. If you want to be biblical, being confessional is the best, safest surest ground on which to stand. Yeah, that's right, Oliver. In fact, the the, the Bible itself necessitates, we could say, confessions of faith. It necessitates it. That it's not just for, sometimes we like to say it's it's good, it's useful for the church, and it is. Mm -hmm. And it's useful and good for the church because it stems from the scriptures. That the scriptures necessitate that we confess the faith. Just to run through a little bit of this, you see that right early on in Deuteronomy 6 with the Shema, that Israel was to confess their faith in the the one true God, the oneness of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
They confessed their faith in who God was. And in fact, that confession of faith led to their love for God, that they would love God with all of their heart and they would love their neighbor as themselves. It, it inspired true love, true devotion and, and piety. But you see that as well in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the, the Shema being extended to confess in the triune God, the Father by whom all things exist, and the Son through whom all things exist. We have confessions. Peter's great confession, confessing in who the Son of God is. Mm. He confesses the faith. And the church is built upon that same confession, the rock, which is Peter's confession. So you see it time and time again throughout the scriptures where the church confesses the faith, they, they receive it by revelation, and they repeat it throughout the scriptures, and then they pass it on from one generation to the next. Yeah, I'm mindful as well, Brett, of, of that wonderful text in 1 Timothy 3. Um, in our translation, we have here, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. But if you actually go back into the Greek, what we've got here, confessedly great, or confessing the mystery of godliness is what makes it great it's it's the it's the godliness the mystery of godliness confessed here and then if you track that forward to jude you know jude wanted to write about their common salvation jude wanted to be encouraging jude wanted to share together in the communion of god and the communion of joy very much uh, as we find John doing at the beginning of his first letter. But he says, I, I found something else more pressing. And what was it that was more pressing? It was to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the state, uh, to the saints. Now, this is the apostolic body of truth mm. upon which, as Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter two, everything else is built and you know, the foundation of the apostles and prophets isn't the foundation of Peter, Paul as, as men, as it were. It's the foundation of the faith that they believed, confessed, made known and passed on. You know, you have this phraseology throughout the New Testament, don't you? Yeah. What I have received that I also deliver unto you. This is the true apostolic succession. It's the faith that is passed from generation to generation to generation. Absolutely. And and it's the idea of what do we confess? What do we believe that confession is per, almost pushing the whole time? What What's it full of? It's just what the scripture teaches. So the confession is merely a statement of faith, which comes from God's word alone. You know, it's that sola scriptura. Again, it's a document of the Reformation. And I think we could say that the Bible right, is the source of truth. Whereas the confession mm. is the summary of the truth, the summary of the faith of what we believe. Mm. And so what do we believe the scriptures actually teach? Mm. And here it is, a system of faith that we could hold to and guard and, and pass on from one generation to the next. Mm. Amen. You, you quoted from the first paragraph of the first chapter and the first sentence. And one of the most wonderful things about this sentence that I love is that it's ours. Mm. There's so much of our confession, and we'll come to this under the uh, discussion of creedal. There you go. Spoiler, that's coming up. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll come back to this then uh, about the way in which the writers of our confession consciously plug into historical theology and use terminology uh, that has been used before. But this is ours. You won't find this anywhere else. <laughs> This is uniquely ours. And what a statement. Let me just give it again, Brad, because it's so good. We've got to have it again. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith and obedience. And that that word certain, by the way, has a very technical meaning. It, it, it means inerrant, really. So we've got inerrancy. We've got sufficiency right here in the first sentence, all about scripture if we're going to be confessional we have to be biblical canonical whole counsel of god if we're going to be canonical biblical whole counsel of god we need to be confessional mm. now that's our conviction isn't it and that's the message we want to get over to the church that's right it made me think of this quote by phyllis shaft he quotes on the necessity of confessionalism 
He says, it may be said that the Christian church has not been without a creed. As faith without works is dead. Faith without confession is dead. That the church has always confessed the faith. It's founded upon mm -hmm. that faith, the certain rule of faith, mm -hmm. the infallible and certain word of God that we are built up upon. So faith without confession is dead. There is no faith to confess. What, what do we confess? Mm -hmm. We confess that apostolic faith that's been handed down throughout the church mm -hmm. and throughout the ages by the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, later on in that same paragraph, that first paragraph, that the writers of the confession point out that through through the history of the church, through the history of God's dealings with humanity, right from the beginning and all the way through, he revealed himself in different ways and at different times. But but now he has given us the full revelation and he has inscripturated that revelation. Think about that word inscripturated. It means written down. And, and the writing down of scripture, what, what's the terminology here? Let me just read it. To commit the same holy unto writing, which maketh the holy scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people now being ceased. What we have is the word of God inscripturated, the counsel of God inscripturated, the whole message of God inscripturated, finished, complete, and delivered to us. So yeah. when we write a confession of faith, we are following that same principle that when you write it down, you define it clearly. And then you have something to hand on to the next generation. So to be confessional is, as Brett says, it is to take those truths of the scripture, to summarize them, to write them down so that we then have something to hand on as I'm physically handing you this confession there you go john mark you're a young man i'm now an older man i've just gone 50 right i've just handed you that confession that is the truth mm. the confession of the truth which is the summary as brett so helpfully said earlier on of that what am i giving you now i'm giving you my bible my lovely shulia <laughs> edition here with all the lovely colored ribbons and the gold and all the rest of it but but if i give you that yeah, that that is the scripture. And this here, this confession is the summary of that scripture. And we can confess that together because it's written down. And it is the outworking, the statement of, the summary of the word of God. Well, there's this necessity there, right, John Mark? There's this necessity to take that revelation, the word of God, and to reflect upon it, study it, meditate upon the word of God, which we're called to do. The scriptures call us to do that. And then to restate it of what the scriptures teach, that the whole counsel of God, what do they, what do they teach? It cannot contradict themselves. The scriptures do not contradict themselves. To restate it and pass it on so that we can confess it together. Amen. Absolutely. And what we have with the confessions, and we'll think about this in relation to the creeds, is a comprehensive statement and and this is something we're going to be wanting to come back to again and again and again whole counsel of god acts 20 whole counsel of god christianity paul did not rest until he had conveyed the whole counsel of god and one of the problems with what we might call a naive biblicism is that it happily trusts the individual pastor or the individual preacher with the, the full um, ability to handle the whole counsel of God. Well, I don't have that confidence. I know Brett here doesn't have that confidence. We do not trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. But when we stand on the scriptures as summarized in our confession, ah, now we have something which enables us to be confident that we can convey the whole message of the whole Bible mm. to our people consistently, comprehensively. And it, having, having a confession binds your conscience to the scriptures. It's, as we'll come on to in, in future episodes, because it's innately communal, the church is bound to that confession. And therefore, it means that if you stray from a certain doctrine that the scriptures teach, it's very clear because then you have fallen from that confessional baseline, if you could say, or standpoint. And therefore, you've got this very clear line of what scripture teaches. And then 
what scripture doesn't teach. And you can make that, that clear distinction. Yeah. It's really helpful to see. Yeah. Therefore, you know, we, we don't stand with those who are a certain doctrine because the scriptures do not teach that. And we see it in yes, our statement. This is, this is so helpful, John Mark, because it brings out one of the, one of the real benefits of being confessional. Um, and as well as being comprehensive, what it, what it is, is it's also inclusive. Mm. Many people look at our confession and say, well, it's not specific enough of this, that or the other. Well, that is all very deliberate because what we want to do is to bind consciences to the scriptures and not to any man-made added extras. And ironically, being confessional does that. If you're just going to be new to scripture, just, just, just a biblicist, just trusting the minister or the pastor or the church leaders at that time to bind your conscience to the scriptures and the scriptures alone. Wow, that's a big responsibility for those men to take and they will almost certainly fail. Mm -hmm. We commend being confessional because being confessional is being creedal. It is being biblical. It is whole counsel of God Christianity. It is bringing churches together and binding conscience. You think of Luther. Yeah, mm. at the great Diet of Worms and, and the, the great moment when, when, he was, when he was challenged, what are you going to stand on, Dr. Luther? And he says, my conscience is bound to the word of God. Mm. Now, to be bound to the word of God is to be bound to the whole counsel of the word of God. Not parts of it, not bits of it, not this over against that. That's where being confessional. And you know, it was the Augsburg Confession, 1530, I think, was the first of the great mm. Reformation confessions. That was the beginning that came out of Lutheranism. Oh, Luther really? wasn't against confessions. That's an interesting point, right? Because we so often hear about the nature of sola scriptura, by right? scripture alone, that's the final authority. That's what came out of the Reformation against Rome, standing upon the word of God. And yet, what do you see right after as you make that point? The writing down of confessions. Believing that scripture is the final authority leads us then to confess the faith, what we believe the Bible actually teaches. Amen. 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 So thank you for both of you for coming on the podcast. It's been lovely to have you here and we're looking forward to our next discussion, which will be the creedal nature of being confessional. And thank you to all of those listening in. Uh, you can find us on YouTube and Facebook at Trinity Grace Church Ramsbottom and our website is trinitygrace.net. Thanks again and bye for now.